what a great week we've had. The, the weather's been beautiful, and um, Iliafi went away on, I think it was Thursday, Friday, so he's back on Monday again. It's my understanding he's back on Monday, is that right? Yeah. Tuesday. And been really busy, so do keep him in your prayers. All right. Welcome to all those people who are online. It'd be great to hear from you guys um, if you just check in with our email and, um, and through our Facebook page or just check in with us. It'd be great to uh, hear from you as well. All right. So, hey, why don't we pray and um, we'll get into the Word. Father, we thank you for your Word. Uh, it's uh, powerful. Your Word is powerful. It uh, tears down strongholds. Your Word holds everything together. The world is held together by your word and the scientists don't even know uh, what holds it all together but we know that your word holds it all together and we pray that your word would come this morning and change us. Lord, we open our hearts to the power and the moving of your word. We ask that you would change us. Lord, that we'd be better today because of your word. Lord, that we'd be better tomorrow and the days ahead because of your word. We open it today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So it's pretty overwhelming to be up here uh, to open the Word of God. I feel kind of inadequate that this amazing book, this Word of God, it's, it, it's, it's the Word of God. It's an amazing piece of literature, isn't it? It's alive and powerful. It's the, the, the rema of our Word of God comes from it. And, um, and, I, and I kind of feel inadequate that I would be able to bring something that's of value to you through this, and, and we feel inadequate, and on top of that, I have to follow on from Pastor Iliafi, and that's no mean feat, because he's a great orator, isn't he, he really, um, he's really an anointed man of God, and so I stand here a little bit uh, with trepidation, um, and a little bit of uh, nervousness, which is probably just quite normal for me, but it's been a great word of God, and um, Ili's been sharing a message around two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the mind of Christ. The kingdom of wisdom as opposed to the carnal mind and the, um, the, the kingdom of the world. And we need to allow God to pierce our hearts. Otherwise, it's just, it's just words. We need to open our heart to allow the, the, um, the presence of God to come in and fill our lives. Otherwise, it's just really just a series of messages. And we don't want that to, to be the case. So we need to open our hearts and then we need to be acting on that word. And I've certainly been convicted over the last couple of weeks about my own thought life, and my ability to walk in the power of the eternal kingdom of God versus that man with the carnal mind, a mind that's set on the temporal passions of the world, and that leads on a bit broad, a broad pathway, a broad highway to death. Amen? So today I'm just going to share a few of those uh, thoughts that I've had over the last couple of weeks as Ili's been sharing this message. And I have a question. I've had a question for God. And I'm going um, to open that and I'm going to uh, share with you what God shared with me around that question. But you'll have to wait to see what that question is a bit later. I'll keep you, keep you on your toes. <laughs> but I think it's this, this, this word that's been coming has been the challenge. It's a huge challenge. Almost the challenge of our lives. It goes to the heart of who we are and how we're going to impact the world. That we can be Christians and yet and sit in the, in the church and still have a mindset that's temporal. I still have a mindset that's carnal. We can sit in, in, in church and never reach our full potential in God. I, I believe God has a plan A for our lives, the heights up here. But how many of us, we only get down to the plan B or plan C, that plan D and E, that mediocre us. And I think we can all identify with that because we're, we're fallen, we're human, we're not perfect. But God, he has a plan A for our lives. And I think the word that Lily's been uh, sharing with us, I think it's, it's like the challenge of our lives to get it right in the way that we think so that we can move mountains, so that we can be like Christ. And I, um, I thought back to a, um, one of my old um, rugby coaches. He was a priest. I went to a, um, a religious school and there was priests there. And, um, and he was an awesome rugby coach. And um, I was willing to lay down my life for him as a coach. He was such a good coach. But he would get on the field, he would come on the field at half time, and he would swear like a trooper. This man of the cloth. He would swear every manner of word that you can think of that you've heard in the Donko room at your workshop. He would say. And it would go out right across the whole field. People would be shocked that this religious man would talk like that. 
And it did something to my spirit as a young man because I, um, while I hadn't given my heart to the Lord, I had a relation. I do believe I had a, uh, quite a strong relationship with God as I grew up. My mum used to call me her God boy. And um, <laughs> some things change over time. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, so it's, uh, it was, um, and, but it did something in my spirit and I, and I, start, and I started to question God. And, um, and, and I moved away from the things of God, not just because of that, but it did have an impact. And, when we, and, and the Bible says we're better to be cold than lukewarm. We do less damage when we're cold. Otherwise, when we're lukewarm, the world sees us doing this and that, and it's not of God, it's a carnal, carnal mindset, and we do damage in that place. And I was reminded um, as a new Christian, new Christian into the church a few years back, quite a few years back actually, and um, I was counting the tithes and offerings um, one night after this Sunday service, and I was there with a deacon, uh, a man of rank in the church, he'd been in the church a long time, um, he had obviously, he obviously um, had some authority, that he was recognised as a deacon, deacon in the church. We sat down to count the money, and we were counting it together, and he made a small error, and he started to swear, he started to pull himself down. And me and being a new Christian, and I was on fire for the Lord, and I, I, I couldn't believe that this guy was speaking like this, and I told him off. I gave him, a, I, I really told him off, don't you, you know, and I, was, I got into it. And I was just a new Christian, and he's a deacon in the church, and I'm telling him off. <laughs> but I believe he started off right. I believe he had that, that God moment, and the, I opened the Bible, and it's like, we open the Bible and go, that's right, we, we, we're in tune with the Word of God, and, and it's like it's open to us, and we agree with it, but something happened. So I, I believe he started to drift away in his thought life, and his attitudes, and his mindset was uh, drifted away from the things of God. And Pastor ellie has been, uh, he, he said to us, just coming to church doesn't, isn't going to make you a man or a woman who will walk in the kingdom of God. I'll put it like this, just because you sit in the garage, you go into the garage, doesn't make you become a car. Does it? You're not going to be a car, are you? But if you sit under the word of God for long enough, maybe you'll get to be a larder. You see those larders putting along on the road? No one really likes a larder, eh? But how do we get to be that, that Jaguar? We all want to be the Jaguar, don't we? Rolls Royce, Mercedes, but Jaguar, that rah. We want to be that guy. We made bed, bed laughing. Yeah, so um, how do we do that? It's about our mindset and our attitude and then our actions will follow that. And so I've been reevaluating my own mindset, my own actions from the prompting of this word. And I'm, I'm going to, am I bringing those thoughts captive which are clearly not of Christ? And we need to, so we need to reevaluate daily. Daily we reevaluate. That's what Lily's been speaking to us. Every day, all the time, we're reevaluating day by day. And I've just three keys to renew in our mind that I just want to have a quick look at. Firstly, first key that I've seen there in the Bible it says in 1 Peter 1 13. I've got there, that one up there. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Gird up the, loin, the loins of your mind. Have, so, girding up. That's put, put it on your belt. When we are going out to play rugby, I used to tie my shorts on, get them on nice and tight. There was purpose in what I was doing. So we need to have purpose in our mind. We need to set time aside to think purposely, purposefully. And we need to meditate prayerfully about the things, the thoughts that we're having in our mind. Amen? Yes. The reality is we all have corrupt thoughts. We all have thoughts that are not of God. When I first came into the church, I thought you were all angels. <laughs> and you're sitting there and you're thinking that guy up there, he's like an angel, isn't he? <laughs> but we get to know one another. We get to know that there are faults and that there are thoughts that we have that aren't of God. And, um, but mostly our thoughts... Mostly I think our thoughts are our own, but there are times when we have these demonic thoughts that come. And um, as a young man, I used, to, I used to get quite angry, eh? I used to have a little temper tantrum every now and again, and I would see red. I think it ran in my family through my mum's 
side of the family. My dad's side of the family were pretty, pretty placid on the whole, but my mum's side of the family had a bit of a temper. Well, somehow I ended up with a bit of a temper as a young man growing up, and I'd see red and get violent, and sometimes I'd see violent, and all I could think of was, I'm going to hurt that person. Yeah? And um, so we have those. And sometimes even today I'd like to give that five-fold ministry out to the odd person that comes around. You know what I mean? So the enemy knows our mind is a powerful place. So are we, are we in control of it? Do we let it ran, run rampant? Rampant minds a little like the devil's playground. In James 1, 5, 5, the double, it says, The double-minded man is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed about by the winds. There's no direction. There's, that person isn't ready. There's no plan. And they're ineffective as opposed to the other person who is, whose mind is set. They have direction, they're ready, they're planned, and they're effective. So as we think in our hearts, so we are, is what the Bible says also. And research, I've seen some research that shows that a person with a really positive mind, you know those really positive people? They're really positive all the time. Sometimes they annoy me a little bit, but anyway, they're really positive all the time. Uh, research has shown that those people, they um, are promoted um, beyond their own ability levels. They're more, more readily promoted in their workplace. And I've worked with people like that. Really, really positive people. And then they get into these positions of um, high um, in, in authority in the teaching circle. And below that, but up, they, maybe they've got the gift of the gab. They're really positive and they, and they sort of rise up to principalship or deputy principals. And actually, they just end up wrecking the place. But their positivity has got them there. But the Bible tells us in Romans 12, 13, uh, 12, 3, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. So we believe with humility. Okay? We have a deep confidence in God, not a big blown up ego. The second point there, um, the key, key to a renewed mind in Colossians 3, verse 2, says, set your minds on the things above not on the earthly things. So it's, it's saying in there, set your mind. And I have the picture of concrete. Okay? It sets. It's, you can't move it. It becomes immovable. It's set in place. And I think of Job, who made a covenant with his eyes. He made a decision between his mind and his physical action that, that uh, he was going to set his mind on the things above. He knew, he, had, he knew that if he allowed his eyes to wander, that that was going to take him from honouring God. It was going to stop him from doing the will of God. And so he set his mind on the things of God, on, those, on that high place. He made a decision. And so we're going to, we need to make those decisions ahead of time. If we know we're going somewhere where there's potential for gossip, make us, we set our mind before we go. If there's, you know, uh, pornography, all the things, all the, all the things out there in the world, we need to set our mind before we go. Amen. See, one moment we have the mind of Christ and we're hearing from God and he's telling us to give to that person or go and do that for, uh, for this person. And then the next minute we reason it gone. We, t we reason it out of our lives and we never actually do it, go and do it. That would be fair, eh? We're worried about what the other person's going to think. We might look like a doofus <laughs> eh? or look, look silly. Um, there was one time when I was a fairly new Christian and God said to me at the end of the Sunday surface, go and see that lady over there and tell her that you want to give her a hug as a son to a mother. And I'm thinking, what? That's a bit weird, isn't it? You know, I was only a new Christian, didn't really know my way around the whole, uh, you know, the whole uh, moving of the spirit and that very well. So anyway, I did do it. And, um, and we hugged and embraced and then we came back to church in the evening on the Sunday service and she was so excited. Her son who... She, whom she hadn't seen for years or heard from for years, they were estranged, rang her that day. And so there was something, I believe, something was broken in the spirit. Something powerful happened in there just by that act. And thirdly, it says in Romans 12, be renewed by the renew, be, sorry, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In Ephesians 5.26, it talks about we're cleansed, by the washing of the word. And so that, that refers back, that's referring us back to having a Bible plan, um, reading the Bible daily. Uh, I, I try to read Proverb, I try to read a Psalm, I try to read Old Testament and New Testament every day. 
and worship God in there too, because the worship that is often built around the Word of God, isn't it? So we need to be doing that every day. The devil can't read our thoughts. He's not omniscient. He's not, he's, he's not all-knowing. But he is going to attack us in our mind. God was attacked. Jesus was attacked in his mind, crown of thorns around his head. He was um, battened with it. Uh, they pierced his mind. That blood that he shed was for our, for our mind. And he gives us the helmet of salvation to wear, to protect our mindset. And that should be our motivating factor. Salvation. The helmet of salvation. In our thought, we should be always motivated by salvation. Firstly, protecting our own salvation, but also working for the salvation of other people. So how do we check to see if our thoughts are acceptable? It's a good question, isn't it? At school, we have these values um, over here at the school. We have four values. The respect of God, respect of self, respect for others, and respect for the environment. So any behaviour that sits outside those four values, I'll front the kids on. I will ask them, did what you do, sit at, does it fit into any of our values? And often their heads will go down and they'll say no. I said no, it doesn't fit in there. So those values determine how we're going to act at the school. They're going to help our students to make good decisions. And so in Philippians 4 verse 8, we get these thought values. I'm just going to call them our thought values. It says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, Whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things of good report, if there be any virtue, if there is any praise, think on these things. Amen? Amen. If we're not thinking like that, grab it. Take it captive. Okay? We need to catch it. Bring it under the blood. Catch it again. Bring it under the blood. Under the blood. And, and slowly our mind will start to release itself from those thoughts. I really do believe that. And Pastor Lilly's uh, taken a quote from him over the last week or so. He said, if only we operated the godly system with the mindset of Christ, the world is yet to see what the church can do. I thought that was really powerful. We've all got a mindset. Some of us have decided minds. Some of us have undecided minds. It's still a mindset. An undecided mind is... It's still, a, it's still a mindset. You come across those people with mindsets that refuse to budge? Like a neighbour or someone like that? They're just stubborn? I really don't like those people very much. They're, they're unwilling to negotiate with my way of doing things and then do it like I said. <laughs> it kind of bugs me a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Hey, and um, it's my way or the highway, those sort of people. But we need to come at it from a humble point of view. I had this student in year nine, he's a year nine student, come from, oh, he used to talk about the other side of the tracks. I think that had to do with uh, Protestants and Catholics. But he came from the rough side of town. And he was uh, probably, um, I, I would imagine, he, was, he had a pretty tough upbringing, I knew that. And probably beaten by his dad. And um, here he turns up in my class, a strong um, male figure. He didn't like me very much. He wanted to... Um, Question my authority. It happened a whole year. It was difficult. He was, I would tell him to sit down. He'd swear, he would swear, get angry. He'd say, um, you see him doing something? And he said, no, it wasn't. And so this went on all year, and we were just like two goats, banging heads together all year. And it was this class that I really, I, I, teachers, I think teachers all have this, I don't want to go to this class today. Not that class again, with this student again, all year. Finally, the year ended, and I was like, oh, I'm not going to have to teach that young fella again. It was like a relief for me. Guess who turned up next year in my year 10 class? <laughs> he turned up in my year 10 class, and I was like, oh, not another year of this. And I just felt God saying, you have to change. It's your mindset that needs to change. And I started to look at him differently. It took me a whole year to work it out. Eh? It, was pretty, it was pretty poor, really. <laughs> and, um, but I just changed things around. I, I would ask him, how, how was his rugby league? He used to love playing rugby league. Ask him about his day, how he's going. I got interested in him, and now I love him. Um, he's a barber. He's, he's, uh, he started barbering, and no one wants to get cut, by a new, cut, cut their hair for, from a new barber, right? So he's sitting down there for weeks. He hadn't even cut anyone's hair. I said, I'll go down. And I went down and got my hair cut from him. Because I, I love him, mate. Eh? I just wanted to bless him. Went down there. It took an hour to cut my hair. I got a ticket while I was waiting. 
and um, and there was this little bit of hair over here that was sticking out, and he couldn't get it with his clippers. Honestly, it was just about raw by the end of the time. Just kept going back, but I did it because I loved him. So there's many things in our thought life that grieves the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's a gentleman. And we can sin in our thoughts. The Bible says if we look at a, um, a woman or a, another person with lust in our heart, um, we've committed adultery. It comes back to our thoughts. And, and we know that where sin is present, God isn't. And the Holy Spirit's going to leave. And even that Jesus and all his pain on the cross, the excruciating pain on the cross, he never cried out. Until that moment where God left him and the sin was placed upon, his, on, upon him. That he was, that was the anguished, that was the anguish cry. Why have you forsaken me? He cried out. You can hear it, eh? You can hear it. It was God left him. And, God, and, and that's like the Holy Spirit will leave us when we commit sin. So we need to get our minds right. If we want, if I've written this down, if we want to walk in Christ, to live him, to speak Him, to allow the power of God to be released and expanded beyond our comprehension, we need to take control of our mind. And I think it's the challenge of our lives. And so I've been convicted and I've been repentant. And guess what comes next? There's a test coming. I'm going to get the test. The test's came. It's already been, it's already been, I've already been tested before I got here today. So, um, so I've been through this process and I'm sitting just down there by where Gary was sitting there the other day and uh, we're just getting school started. So getting school up and running, it's quite a, quite a piece of work, you know, there's meetings about meetings, there's lots of things going on and, and amongst all that, the ministry have got pressure on principals, they've got to get a, um, a strategic plan in, they've got to get a charter in, they've got to do an annual, uh, annual plan, um, analysis of variance, whatever that is. You know, it's all this highfalutin, it's, all, it's lot, quite a lot of pressure going in on me. As, and, um, and I'm feeling it, you know. And, uh, and Ellie sort of walks past, he's on away this, you see now he's like, hey, he's pretty laid back. He said, um, going away this week, you're looking after the church and you're preaching. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> my wife's off at, she's off at the Masters game, so having a lovely time. We've got the kids, five of them at home with me. Well, it's not that easy, eh? And, um, and so the test comes, and uh, what do you reckon I thought? I tried to keep it pretty calm inside. I was pretty calm. See, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I do it for you, Lord. Even though I might be a bit rough up here and embarrass myself, it's for you and for the cross, God. That's the attitude. Don't, um, Dwight L. Moody, I just come back to it all the time. Don't worry about the sermon. Pray the word of God would come down into our heart. So try not to criticise my preaching this morning, okay? <laughs> Just pray and open your heart that the word of God would come in and do something powerful. See, God wants to extend the ten pegs of our mind. Yeah. Yeah. He wants to increase our capability yeah. to be bigger, better, and more equipped. Came, I was thinking about that, and I thought, who, who remembers Steve Austin, the $6 million man? <laughs> uh, it came into my mind, you know? You know, I don't know if you know the story. Most of us do because we're a little bit, we're the older, older service in here, and um, older, but young at heart because Steve Austin, you know, and <laughs> and, uh, and uh, they rebuilt him, they made him better, faster, and stronger, and that's like the word of God for us. And these, it, 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 we translate his mind, his mind into our mind. We become better faster and stronger. Yeah. See, the world says I can't. God says you can do all things through me. Who yeah. You're stupid, yeah. the world would say. You're too dumb to do that. I'll use you to confound the wise, is what God says. It's too big, it's too hard. You only need faith the size of a mustard seed and you'll move that mountain, is what God says. The world says be anxious and take a pill. God says... In your weakness, my strength is made perfect. The world says, be afraid of death. Doesn't it? Yes. Eh? The world's out there, they're afraid to die. They're looking for ways to live longer. Paul says, it's better that I go and be with him yes. than to walk in this world. Amen? So which, which mind are we going to have? The carnal mind which opposes, opposes God? Our carnal mind opposes God. It stops God. It's almost like it stops God. It's opposing him. We're working against him. 
It says uh, a fool says in his heart there is no God. In Romans 1, 20, 20, it says, Professing to be wise, they became fools, exchanging God's glory of an, imm an immortal, of an immortal, all-powerful God to a dead image, a dead thought. Are we denying God when we think in the deficit? That's what the Bible is asking us. I think the answer is, is true. We deny God when we have dead thoughts. See, man's wisdom, the carnal mind says the theory of evolution. The result is death. Carnal mind says we're going to control the population through abortion. Death. We're going to use aborted fetuses which is for stem cell research and, and to try and live longer. Death, right? Divorce is simple and without fault. Death. I come from a family where the, um, with my parents divorced. The consequences are long-reaching. Death comes. We say our children, they can solve their old problems, their own problems. We don't need to give them guidance. What do we got? We got death on the other end of that. But God's wisdom, that omni omniscient presence that comes into us, that wisdom that comes is life. God used, caused the nation to prosper through Joseph in the middle of a drought. The whole, uh, the whole area of, that, um, of, that, uh, of the world prospers because Joseph was there with wisdom. Solomon, who was endowed with wisdom, built a country in peace and a temple that was known as the wonder of the world. Daniel, whose political career stemmed, uh, 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 stemmed two kings, the king of Babylonia and the king of, Bur of Persia, life came. Peter preached at Pentecost and we're still seeing the repercussion of that preaching today. Life came. The God who gave Paul a tent maker, he gave him wisdom to be able to navigate a storm and get to the other side. His life came. You know, French scientists, they, uh, they took um, tissue from the brain of a quail, of a French quail. They took the, um, the tissue from it and they implanted it in the embryo of, uh, embryo of five chickens into the embryo to see if they could make the chicken chirp like a quail. And they actually succeeded. They actually made that happen. But the real, the great miracle is that God is able to translate his mind into ours. Amen? The Spirit of God takes up residence in us. He gives us, our, uh, he gives us wisdom without reproach when we ask for it. Wisdom that any, no PhD can give us. Amen? And so the last few weeks, how are we going for time? Not too bad. If I could give, give another 10 minutes, I'll get through this. I'll, give you, I'll answer the question that I, uh, that I had for God. So I've had this question for God. What exactly is the mind of Christ? What, is it look, what does it look like in action? I'm not sure if you guys had that same question or not. I think it's all those lovely things that we do. It's humility and all those things and, and all that. But, but God's answered our question. And I found there, it's, um, it's really nice that he outlines it for us in Philippians 2, verse 5 to 11. So Paul's writing to a really sh a struggling church, a, a church that's struggling with selfishness, with pride. They had a high opinion of themselves. They're unwilling to look out for, um, for others, to help others. And so I'm correcting them to understand. He wanted, the, he wanted them to understand that they need to be transformed, not conformed to this age, but renewed in their minds to be able to know the perfect, good, and pleasing will of God. So they can do the plan A that God has for them to do. So let's just have a look at Philippians. The first part of that um, piece of scripture in verse 5 and 6 says, let's read it together. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. So that's my first point, the first part of God's mind. It's a mind that surrendered and submitted to the will of, will of the Father. He didn't think it was robbery. Okay? He, was, he, was, um, he was equal with God, and yet he gave that up to come down, obediently came down in a humble fashion, and came down to earth for us. And I just uh, I thought about Abraham and how Abraham went off to sacrifice his son. He was obedient to God's call. But then I just started to think about Isaac and how Isaac, um, his father, placed that wood for the sacrifice, that burnt offering that, um, that was, he was going to be. He wasn't sure at that day. He wouldn't have known at that stage. 
Um, but this wood that was placed on his back it would have been a considerable load. And so often we think of um, Isaac as being just a young boy. He, I, I, I believe he was a, he was a, a, a big, big, strong man. Uh, in Jewish tradition, they have a binding ceremony, and, um, and, they, and it's not until the men turn 37 that they have that ceremony where, the, where they're bound. And that's in, 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 um, in relation to him being placed on the altar. It's 37. So he was somewhere probably between 20, 37. Some scholars would say he was about 33. So he was a big, strong man. And Abraham was an old man. And so they got, so he had to carry the wood to the mountain, and then he carried the wood up the Maunga and got there, and then his father started to bind him, bound him, he said, and, and he was placed on the altar. Now, I think at any stage in there, being a strong man, if he knew he was going to be bound and placed on an altar for sacrifice, he could have fought back, yeah? But he, I believe he chose not to. I believe he was like Jesus. He went there like a lamb. He obeyed. And he took his place on top of that altar. And we know the story from there, um, where the lamb was found and his life was spared. So I was out there washing, I was out there just as I was sort of preparing, and I was out um, watching some men fish on the river. It was a beautiful day. Uh, the, the tide was full, the, uh, the water was green, it was beautiful. It was just something in me just, just um, wanted to go and just hang out and just do fishing and not worry about everything else that was going on. You've been like that, have you? I just, yeah. And it's just like God, God said, go back to school and start teaching the kids. Go back and prepare yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that fishing didn't look good, though. But we need to get out, our, get out of our own space where we want it for us. And, and Jesus was able to do that. He gave up. He didn't think it was robbery, but he gave it up anyway, obediently to his father. Amen. The second point that I want to talk to in, um, is verse 7, regarding the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is not reputationable, or reputational, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming to the likeness of men. He became self-abased, no reputation. He didn't even have a house to, um, to live in. He gave up equality with God in eternity. There was no selfishness in him, no ambition, no conceit in him. But how we consider our standing before other people is something to be held on to. We're all, you know, I think we all have amb ambitions to be better, and I think that's good, but sometimes we, it becomes our God. And um, when I was moving from Cullinane, God was rustle, rustling me out of, the, um, out of the, uh, the nest. He was rustling his feather. It was time for me to go. The biggest battle I had in going from there wasn't so much leaving. Uh, well, it, well, it was. The, the children, I was going to miss the children. That was a big part of it. But there was this... Um, there was this feeling like I was giving up my reputation. I was giving up my job that I worked really hard for. And it was really hard. It was a really difficult decision that I had to make. But I'm pleased I did, that I was able to let it go. Because something greater was waiting on the other side of that for me. And so I shifted from Cullinane. And we need to get rid of the idea that God is here for me. We have to have a mindset that I'm here for you, God. So if we consider our needs, our wants, our distinction, that it's to be preserved at all costs, then we don't have the mind of Christ. The third point, the mind of Christ is servile. In verse, verse 7 and 8, is it? Well, it was verse 7, going back to that other one. But he made himself of no reputation, taken in the form of a bond servant. So he's a servant. Okay, God was a servant. Jesus came down and became a servant for us. Do we have to be begged and prodded to serve? I think sometimes we do. When, we, when Tash and I were running our junior program, we did that for 16 years. Often we would go and ask people, would you like to come and help us in junior church? And sometimes I would see the calling on people's lives. I could see the gifting that they had to work with the children. Sometimes I knew it was this training ground for them to go on and do other things from. But they would say, no, I've got to go and pray about that. I'll just go and pray about that. You heard that before. I'm just going to go and pray about that. 
Oh, good, good. Let's go and pray about it, but then go and do it. But often it's just an excuse to get away from that act of service. You know, we're going to ask people to go out and, um, and serve and on the door and all those sorts of things, but do you, do you have to be prodded into it? If you do, I would say that you don't have the mind of Christ in that. I remember when I'm, we, we've decorated out the front a few times in my walk since I've been here in the church, and I think we were on to about, it seemed like the fifth or sixth time that I was painting the toilets out there, and I had a really bad attitude, I, was, I said I would, do, I would come and paint it, and I had a bit of a bad attitude, it was in the school holidays, I was a bit tired, I had a bad attitude to it, and then uh, about a week later of this bad attitude, and the, um, and the elder that was in there was, um, was working and was around, keeping an eye on us and that, he rebuked me from the pulpit told me off, have you ever been rebuked from the pulpit using your name? Well, I got rebuked from the pulpit because of my bad attitude, and I deserved it, eh? <laughs> I've actually been, um, I've, been I've, had, I've been threatened with violence before by the senior minister as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I get myself in it, eh? But anyway, so, <laughs> so, but that's happened, happened to me, and, uh, and so I was feeling pretty bad about it, and then the school, was, the school buildings were put down the back there and um, I got the opportunity to serve again. So I jumped into it wholeheartedly. It was like a second chance. And I just did it, did it really, um, just got in there and got teams together and we painted the building up the back and it was great. And you know, that's, where I should, that's what we should be doing, um, serving for God. And this, uh, this wonderful, uh, beautiful Christian lady up there when I was painting, I was actually on my own still painting, I wasn't quite finished off. And she came up, she prophesied over me. And, um, and, that, and that prophecy has come true. Over the years, it came true, and I just want to say thanks, thanks for that prophecy. It was, it was really powerful, and that, that's where we are when we're in a place of service. God will come and bless us. Fourthly, we see the sacrificial mind of Christ in verse eight. He was willing, whatever the cost, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. He sacrificed himself for us. He yielded himself to die as an outlaw. He who didn't know any sin became sin for us. Let this mind be in us which was in Christ. To sacrifice ourselves. If we're not laying our life down for one another, if we're only thinking about ourselves, if we're not giving that extra like the little lady that gave the, the mites was all she probably had. She had given more than the Pharisees who were saying, look, I gave all this money. She gave just a little, little bit, but it was a lot for her. Yeah. It hurt. Yeah. She gave to it hurt. If we're not doing that, I suggest we haven't got the mind of Christ. Nearly there. In verse, and, the, and the fifth point, in verse 9 to 11, let's read that. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and know of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Christ's mind is future focused. In the future every knee is going to bow to him. There's knees bowing now but in the future every knee will bow before him. God with Jesus on the cross, he was able to enjoy the, endure the pain of the cross for the joy that was set before him. He had his eye on the prize after the cross. He had to walk through and walk onto the cross or be nailed to that cross. But his focus was on the future for you and I. He saw you and I in the future with him in eternity. And we need to have that mindset as well. We need to have the mind where we're looking out for the future of others, to, for the future of our family, for the future of, um, of, of those who are lost in sin. We need to be working for them, praying for them, sharing with them, being that living letter to them as well. And I see uh, Elaine Gush and some of the older ladies. And there, was a, there was a split in the church a few years back and... Um, but there, and, um, and, and people left, and, and that was fine, that was all good, but there was, some, there was a group of little, little ladies. Some of them have gone on to, um, to, um, to glory now. Gone on to glory. They stayed, eh? They, even though they weren't in agreement, they stayed. 
they, if it wasn't for them that would stay and kept tithing and that, I'm not sure we'd be here today. They were future focused. Um, Ian Mellings, future focused when he went to Buryatia, taking the word over there. We went over there last time and we were able to do amazing things over there. But before that, before all that happened, on the other ten times that he was over there, where he was praying and prayer walking for months on end, where there was nothing really happening. The future was, we went there, we sh- wherever we went, we were sharing the gospel over there. It was really, really powerful. There was a future focus, and we were able to stand on those people's shoulders and look further because they were future focused. We can see further because their minds were focused on the future. And that's what I want us, um, want us to be aware of, that we need to be thinking about the future. So that's the challenge of our lives. I really believe it's the challenge of our lives to sort our minds out and walk with Christ. Let's stand and pray.